to see the benches smile. In the beginning was the Word, and in the end was the Word. And in between were words, beautiful words, soaring words, words that moved a nation and enthralled a world, words that for a wonderful moment were more powerful than armies, words that made the most terrible sacrifice seem part of a glorious struggle, words that echoed across the oceans and down the decades. Woodrow Wilson was a man of words. His actions weren't insignificant. He guided America onto a new plateau of social responsibility, and he led the nation to victory in a terrible war. But his legacy was his words. And though his steps faltered at his journey's end, his words lived on, inspiring later generations to achieve what he never could. Wilson was from the South by way of the North, which went far toward explaining how he won the Democratic nomination for president in 1912. His forebears hadn't been long in America, with his mother an immigrant and his father the son of immigrants. Scots predominated in his ancestry, although some kin had relocated to the north of Ireland, allowing Wilson to claim Irish lineage when convenient. His father grew up in Ohio, where he met Wilson's mother, who had narrowly escaped being swept overboard by a rogue wave en route from Liverpool. The couple married in 1849, two weeks before Joseph Wilson's ordination as a Presbyterian minister. They remained in Ohio long enough to have two daughters, but in 1854, a better pulpit became available in western Virginia, in the Blue Ridge town of Staunton. There, Thomas Woodrow Wilson was born on December 28, 1856. Yet Tommy, as the boy was called, never knew Staunton, at least not to remember, in 1858, the ambitious Reverend Wilson found another church in Augusta, Georgia. At a time when the issue of slavery had grown explosively sensitive, Joseph Wilson followed many of his southern colleagues in the cloth in discovering biblical sanction for the peculiar institution. The Bible had less to say about secession when that came, but Joseph Wilson had no difficulty rendering Caesar, or Jefferson Davis, his due. During the Civil War, Wilson served briefly in the Confederate Army before returning to his flock. Had the Wilson family lived in Atlanta or on the route of Sherman's march to the sea, the war would have had a deeper influence on young Tommy. But Augusta was comparatively sheltered, and the conflict often seemed something that happened to other people. This impression grew stronger in retrospect, for after the Southern surrender, the northern roots of the family, combined with Joseph Wilson's religious calling, protected the household from the harsher aspects of Reconstruction. Yet perhaps Tommy wouldn't have noticed the revolutionary events of the war and its aftermath, even if Sherman himself had burned the Wilson house down. In youth, he displayed an uncanny ability to view life as if from outside. Later, speaking of children generally, but almost certainly extrapolating from his own experience, he characterized the typical child as standing upon a place apart, a little spectator of the world. Referring specifically to his own childhood, he said, I lived a dream life. The dreams of another Civil War child, Theodore Roosevelt, who experienced the conflict from the relatively safe distance of New York City and whose life path would intersect Wilson significantly, were filled with literary adventure, with tales of the heroes of history and romance. But not Tommy Wilson's, for the boy in Georgia didn't learn to read until he was ten years old. A later generation of pediatricians and educators likely would have diagnosed dyslexia, but in Tommy's time, the boy just seemed slow. Had he been of a different family, he might have turned his back on the land of letters. But with a father whose vocation depended on translating the word of God into the words of men, and who, by the evidence of every Sunday, excelled in the art, Tommy couldn't help being drawn in. He perceived letters and words as possessing a mysterious power, a power not easily captured, and the more potent for its elusiveness and mystery. When he finally did decode the alphabet and enter the priesthood of the literate, he felt an exhilaration that stayed with him his whole life.